already today we've had a lot of conversation around standardization which is actually as many of you will know what is really at the core of smart maritime network um, and it's for that reason that i'm very pleased to have henk Mulder from iata here today um, here in our shipping world we know we still have a long way to go um, as the discussions today have already demonstrated um, and learnings from other industries are going to be key to that. I think it was mentioned earlier that IATA are very much the gold standard for this um, within aviation. So I'm very interested to hear more from Hank and learn what they are doing at IATA around this and see perhaps how we can transfer it over to our maritime um, world. So on that note, um, I'm gonna hand over to Hank. I'll let Hank um, introduce himself and introduce IATA. Hank. Over to you. Thank you very much, Kathy, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be at this conference in Copenhagen virtually. Um, I've heard the, the, the name IAT a few times this morning. Uh, let me introduce myself and a little bit of why IAT may or may not be relevant here. Uh, my name is Hank Muller. I am the head of digital cargo at IAT. Uh, I've had many roles there. Currently, it's that particular one. Uh, and I've been working in digitalization for my whole career. So, so in that sense, uh, the, the, what I've learned over the years is the air transport. I already was equipped with digitalization. So that comes in handy in my job here. Um, IATA, uh, in some ways, it is magical because it is the only association that is uh, managing or looking after standards and lobbying for the air transport sector, and, uh, both for passenger and for uh, cargo. Um, and in many ways, we have the ability to set standards uh, that, that really facilitate the, the all activities within the industry. Uh, but also, in many ways, we can't just set a standard. It is still a process that requires buy-in for every single player. So as much as it's great to have a single organization, um, it's not a given that everything that we want to do actually happens, because it still is a, it's a process of buy-in of the members. Um, let me just share my screen and, and talk about um, digitalization. See if that works. Okay, very good. Hopefully, you can see my screen. Um, I will go on the assumption that you can. Um, so, what I would like to talk about is a uh, it's a case study in a sense uh, of, of where we are in the air transport industry with digitalization. And so I'll take you back a little bit where we came from, uh, but also why this is relevant and, and, and why I, I firmly believe that uh, we can actually learn from each other. And that works both ways. Um, first question is what, why is an airline even at a, at a maritime conference? And the, the, the reason I've been seeking very actively really for the last few years for contact in other modes of transport is that we have the same customers. Um, initially, when I started pushing digitalization within the air cargo world, um, very often when I went to our customers, which are the forwarders, uh, the first thing they would say is, well, is whatever you're doing going to work for maritime and for road as well, uh, for rail and for, for waterways? And then I couldn't answer the question because I only represent the air cargo. And so uh, it, this has been, in a sense, a blocker the fact that we have a common customer, but we haven't got common solutions. And this really adds a huge burden to those customers, to those forwarders and to the ships behind them, uh, that they have to implement all of these different digitalization solutions. Um, and so in that sense, the, uh, the, the fact that we would speak with each other here in a conference like this and try and work common approaches to, to digitalization is absolutely fundamental for us to be able to do anything at all. Because if the customers can't follow, then we're not going to go very far. Um, the other thing that I've learned in the process of, of discussing with, uh, uh, with this industry, with the maritime industry, but also with the other modes of transport, is that our digital challenges are pretty much the same. Uh, it's different angles, different, different solutions that are done better in one mode or the other, but the challenges are exactly the same. And then the last thing that, that really matters is that we're working in exactly the same context. And of course, today we're in a COVID crisis, which is uh, on the airline side is really messing things up. But 
as one of the previous speakers said, it's, there's many opportunities in there. And there's a lot of positive things happening as well. Uh, but similarly, before COVID, we were talking a lot about e-commerce. And e-commerce is presenting opportunities and big challenges as well. So, and they they turn out to be very similar whether you are running an airline or whether you're running a, a shipping line. So in that sense, I think our problems are the same. Um, let, let's have a quick look at you know some of the differences. Uh, I just googled this one this morning um, just to get a sense of, of dimension. Um, if, if the 747 freighter, which is an airplane without windows, and you see them sometimes. Um, you could fit in the contents of five trucks, whereas a large container ship can take the equivalent of 44 miles of train. Okay, this this shows you the difference in dimension, um, and, and this very much also explains, of course, the dynamics behind um, the, the the transport modes. Uh, and then you may ask, well, why do we even worry about you know, air transport? If it's so insignificant and um, the numbers we have looked at is that indeed uh, air cargo only represents one percent of the global trade by volume. Right, it's nothing. Uh, at the same time, it turns out that a lot of the very valuable goods are transported by by air, uh, and there are different types of goods that, that explain why the value is so high. Uh, but this is this is this is sort of the this is a big difference, and it also shows a little bit. Um, why digitalization perhaps has a different um, meaning on, on air transport uh, compared to other modes of transport. Uh, the problems are different, the, the, the freight being moved is different. Uh, of course, the time is different. You know, an airplane rarely stays in the air for more than 24 hours. Uh, if it does, it's, it's, it's set records. So, so the, the, the whole time dimension is different. This, this has an impact, of course, on, uh, on how you manage things that we were just in a recession on. And crew. Crew is very important in airlines as well, but we haven't got the same dimensions in terms of time. So, a few years ago, we did a campaign to explain air cargo to, to lots of stakeholders, and I've just picked out a few of the brochures that we made then. And, and one on the left here concerns immunization. Uh, it's very important because vaccines, by and large, are transported by air, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, then you've got funny things like airplanes carrying airplanes. Uh, Another odd thing is that uh, when you travel with your pet on uh, airplanes, they're actually shipped as cargo. You know, they're not shipped as, as passengers, obviously, uh, but they're actually cargo. But they get first class treatment. And then the last one in this example here is, is that things like diamonds, you know, they're obviously shipped by air, uh, partly because it's quick, partly because it's contained. Uh, and very often you can have somebody on board as well to do the shipment. And what you don't realize, and, I, I'm not flying anymore, and I'm assuming that most of you are not flying either. But the next time that you step in an airplane, you may well be sitting on a stash of diamonds that is literally just under your seat. Um, not, don't start digging for it because the chances are that they're not actually under your seat. But this is this is what happens. So air cargo is, is, is different from maritime transport. But as I said, it's it's the same, and, 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 and many things are the same. And in fact, even uniforms, as you can see on the right here. Uh, have a lot of similarities, so we're, we're doing the same job. Let me just come back to um, the vaccine transport. On a typical year, and this is pre-COVID, uh, vaccines will save about three million lives a year. This is information we've got from the World Health Organization. We're also transporting something like 62,000 tons of humanitarian aid, right? That's a normal year, and now we have COVID. And, and, and so at the moment we are, are looking into how are we going to be transporting those, those vaccines. Uh, this is a logistical challenge that has never been faced by, by any mode of transport before. Um, we now we need to save whatever is close to 8 billion people. If you need two injections, then we need 16 billion doses because this is a global, uh, global pandemic. Uh, and it, based on the numbers that we have today, for example, if you look at the number of people that have died in the US alone, and you compare that to the population, we're talking about the equivalent of 6 million lives that, that, that at least that may be saved going forward. There may well be more than that. Um, one challenge is that the, uh, the actual logistics around uh, the vaccines are, are very challenging. Uh, you've all heard news about the Pfizer vaccine that was announced earlier this week. Uh, well, it needs to be transported at minus 57 degrees, uh, which means dry ice. 
which means that uh, we have some limitations in transport because you can only put so much dry ice in an airplane. So as you can imagine, dry ice will, will evaporate and become CO2. And you don't want to have a passenger cabin full of CO2 that comes from the belly hole. So, so that's just in the airplane. Then we have the cool chain storage of this vaccine. And this is a massive problem. And, and we actually think it will take something like two years to produce and distribute these vaccines. So whenever you hear an announcement in the news about a new vaccine that's available, you'll need to add some time to that before that actually make it to your arm. Right? It's, not, it's not obvious. But, but um, that is not, not the kind of digitalization, which is what I wanted to talk about, even though we are looking at ways that we may be able to support that and improve uh, the certainty of, of the transport and actually know that it was transported accurately and that within the time frames that uh, the very limited and short lifespan of these vaccines. One thing that COVID-19 has, has changed already since the beginning of the year is that what was a possibility before, which was that we could transport documents related to trade, is no longer a possibility. Um, it's a biosafety hazard. Uh, we actually have to make sure that documents are digitalized uh, or digitized, because otherwise we, we risk to spread the virus more than we would like to. And so touch-free freight as a general concept is now the default, uh, certainly in air transport, but I'm pretty sure it's the same in cross transport. Touch-free freight is now the default. The other thing that's become the default is what we're doing here right now, is, is remote work, home work. Uh, as much as I, I, I love going to conferences, uh, we're not doing it anymore. We're all doing it remotely and it's work. And this, again, has become the standard. And so we're working from home. We are actually operating our businesses from home. And that can only work in a fully digitized and digitalized environment. So the, the world has changed. And certainly from my perspective and the work that I've done, I've seen that impact. I've seen the demand for digitalization. I've seen the support for it at a time uh, of, of enormous crisis. Uh, as, you, as you're sure you've seen in the news, passenger transport is pretty much finished on the airline side. I think we're down to like 10%, 20% of most of the usual uh, capacity of transport. Now, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the freight is, is carried in the bellies of air airplanes that are carrying passengers. And if you don't carry passengers, you're not carrying belly freight. So there's a massive reduction in the capacity available for air freight. Um, we don't have so many freighters that are dedicated to freight, as you might imagine. So there's a huge crunch in, in available capacity. So again, COVID is really upsetting things and, and, and pushing for things like more efficiency to support digitalization. I'd like to take you back a little bit in terms of where we have come from. Um, as was mentioned previously, IATA has the capability of, of uh, coordinating and, and setting standards, but also to some degree enforcing standards uh, within the industry. And so we've done this for a long time. IATA itself was founded in 1945, and we have been setting standards ever since. And, and incidentally, the, the reason it was founded in 1945 was that it was probably one of the first globalized industries on the planet. And at that time, we did not have electronic facilities. And so we actually needed the Trade Organ Trade Association to coordinate things like standards across the planet. Of course, people would then meet in person to discuss these things. Uh, but we did have hundreds of airlines, and so it wasn't something that could easily be managed otherwise. So this is really why I have this found in the first place. But if I focus on digitization, um, the, the first news is bad news. You know, We are still, even as airlines, uh, putting a lot of paper out there that is supporting the uh, actual movement of cargo. Uh, 7,100 tons of paper every year. This is like 80 volumes, 70, 70, full of paper. And that is, uh, okay, this is a few years old, but I'm pretty sure those numbers haven't, haven't gone down. Um, and, and that is just the air transport side. I also know that we transport paper or freight that belongs to other modes, including that. So, so there's still far, far, far too much paper that needs to be got rid of. And so we have been in this game for a while. Um, I think naturally, uh, given the uh, short duration of, of flights, 
uh, electronic uh, exchanges have been around for a long time in Ghana, as is, is necessary. Obviously, if the plane takes off, then you need to communicate uh, with the arrival destination that the plane is arriving very soon. And so electronic communication has been around for a long time. And when it comes to freight, um, the sort of the, the work itself started uh, really in the 70s, not so before. Um, and, and the initial um, uh, standards we had was something that we refer to as cargo interchange message procedures or cargo info short. Um, this is all based on EDI messaging. We have something like 60, more than 60 message types. So it could be anything from a dangerous goods declaration to an invoice to a airway bill. Um, so for every type of document, we have a message. In 2014, we, we froze that standard and we did it at the 34th edition. So if you do the calculation, you can see that the first edition was published in 1980. Um, and, and, and before that, even then, we had standards like this that were emerging. Uh, but that's how far back we go. Now, the relatively um, upsetting news for me as a digitalization professional is that today 95% of all of our communications are still based on those 1980 message uh, concepts, uh, which is shocking. And I know it's the same in other parts of the world too. But as a, as, a, as a person that has spent 34 years uh, in digitalization, this is, this is very upsetting. And the fact that when I started my career, I worked at CERN in Geneva at the time when the World Wide Web was invented by Tim Berners Lee. So I, I've witnessed the changes that it has brought to the world, but it hasn't brought it to air freight, which is, which is, uh, which is a reality that we, we are living in. So moving forward, in 2005, we started a, a very concerted effort to try and move on from EDI. Uh, we developed a whole set of XML standards, uh, 20 plus messages. Turns out that um, XML really is a more advanced version of Cargo Imp. Um, you can do a lot more with it, but the reality is you're still moving documents around electronically. So the fundamental concept hadn't changed. And as a result, the impact has been limited. I think perhaps 5% of the uh, electronic messages today are, are actually in XML in the airline world. And it's very hard to get rid of that. Now, moving on from there, uh, three years ago, I joined this, uh, this activity on the cargo side. Before they had done a lot of work on the passenger side, uh, which was already far more digitalized, as you know. And you use e airway, you use e tickets, and you have barcode and boarding passes, and all that stuff. So, on the passenger side, things were already looking more better, but not on the cargo side. And so, I initiated a development around the development of a new standard for data sharing, which is based on very different concepts that are, that are far removed from EDI messaging. And this is what I'm going to be talking about in the next few. Uh, minutes. Um, it's basically an API for data sharing and everything that comes with it. Uh, we're not transporting documents, we're transporting data. It's quite different and they are described in classes. It is relatively new, uh, but we're making good progress and it's quite certain this is here to stay. And uh, certainly in the context of the need for digitalization, this is very much uh, that the industry is building on. And this is very much what I'm also advocating on the outside. Um, just a sort of a, a, a quick uh, overview of why EDI and data sharing are so different. Um, EDI is very much a, a sort of a, an entity to entity uh, processor. Uh, the shipper will, will put electronic documents together, which they send to the forwarder. The forwarder does his stuff, sends it to a ground handler at an airport, who all does his stuff and her stuff, moves it on to customs, it goes to the airline, and then on the other side, on arrival, it's exactly the same process in the reverse, but essentially we're moving electronic documents from one party to the next. So that's all very well, except that uh, if one party doesn't pass on all the information, we have a problem. And this is far more common than you would imagine, uh, simply because not all the information that one party receives needs to be passed on to the next one, or perhaps not at the same quality. So a typical example is that a shipper might put all of the destiny concerning information uh, related to the address. But somewhere along the line, some field is too short and the address gets cut off and you lose final information for delivery. And this is typical in, in EDI. Uh, if, if 
least in our world. And so we, we want to move on from there and, and start focusing on distributed shipment records, which are essentially sharing the data uh, all along the entire uh, transport chain. So instead of having this sequential process, you have a, an environment where every party uh, shares that information that it needs with the other parties. And what that means is that if, if, if in any intermediate point, if somebody doesn't pass on the information, it doesn't matter because you actually have access to the original information at source. So it's, it's a far more robust environment in terms of having access to information. And it has a few impacts. Um, firstly, one of our biggest challenges around data quality is, is mostly sold because we're not relying on, on intermediaries to pick up information, transform it, and to pass it on uh, with, with, with the correct quality and, and the correct uh, uh, scope. The original information is always available, so we have far more guarantees to, to get the right information from the right party. And the whole approach of sharing information like this increases visibility and transparency enormously, uh, because now all of a sudden we have direct access. And so, uh, for example, a, uh, you would, might imagine that, for example, a customs uh, in the destination uh, would get direct access to shippers information at source, which may provide them information about the goods that are being transported that might otherwise have been lost along the way. So the direct access is, uh, provides far more visibility and transparency. Another thing that, uh, that we have uh, really built in deep into the standard is about plug and play connectivity. What we mean with that is that what you really want to be able to do is if you work with a, uh, an entity um, in, in your transport chain, uh, perhaps a new forward that you haven't worked with yet as an airline, you should be able just to connect to them without having to get onto the phone and start connecting systems and creating your protocols and doing testing. None of that should be necessary. And the vision behind this is the same as you have for the USB cable that you plug into your computer. Um, when I plug a, a mouse or a USB key into my computer, it just works. I don't have to set anything up. And, and our vision was that it should be the same for plugging in with other systems or partners that you work with. Um, another thing that, uh, that we want to make sure works is that we are actually compatible with the future. Future being machine learning, AI, uh, um, intelligent data, I was going to say big data, but even big data is not a concept now, uh, but smart data, conversational computing, and all of these things. So, so whatever it is, we, we have to move forward rather than move back. And then perhaps the most important point uh, that we believe um, we need to cater for is the next generation. Uh, we have all of these digital natives, uh, we have them at home, I have them at home, you may have them at home, uh, that, that have grown up with their uh, smartphones, that have grown up with the the vast access to information and bandwidth uh, via fiber connections and name it. Um, in 10 years from now, they will be our bosses. In 10 years from now, they're going to be leading our companies. And if I were them, the first thing I would do is issue an electronic memo to say that paper was from now on banned in my organization. Um, and if you imagine sending a memo like that today, it would stop our business, right? So we have to get ready for we have to get ready for a next generation of programmers that can actually work with the things they've learned at school rather than having to work with 14 year old technology. A um, few things uh, just to explain what it is we've actually developed. Uh, we refer to it as the Internet of Logistics. Um, and, and when I say Internet, I mean the real Internet. I don't mean some sort of conceptual idea that looks like the Internet, but it's the real Internet that you connect to via, uh, via your uh, Ethernet connections or your. your Wi-Fi or whatever you want to use. And so essentially all the parties they connect to the uh, to each other via the internet using on record protocols and then they have to they talk to each other. And so one of the concepts we're all aware of on the internet is the URL, the one that you type into your browser in order to do this meeting. So every element, everything related to air freight will have a URL. And whether it's a shipment, whether it's the element of the shipment, whether it's the identity of the of handler or whatever it is, everything has a URL, and that's where the information is. It's a very, very simple one. Um, we base this on three pillars, um, being data, API, and security. And with these three, you have these three things, you can talk to anyone else uh, in, in the world records in the logistics environment. 
a couple of the, but a few design principles that we put behind this. I have to say that the, the data part of this was perhaps the most important part of our standard. And, and so we had some design principles behind that. The first one is that it had to be P-centric. And P-centric essentially means that um, we should be able to identify within our data model the smallest element of frame. Um, the smallest element might be a container, or it might be the box in the container, or it might be the product inside the box that was inside the container. These are all pieces, so it's like a, a, a nested concept. You can have pieces and pieces and pieces. Um, this is very different from the original concepts that we had, were all based on shipments, um, which has its limitations being it's now consolidating or deconsolidating shipments, so that became a problem. So we have lots of complex processes to deal with that. But going forward, we have the concept of a piece, so we can always get to the, to the element that's actually being shipped. Um, maybe I'll just go through a little bit faster, because I actually have separate slides. Um, I won't therefore repeat this one. Um, another element in terms of our design was physics oriented. Uh, everything is a digital twin. This is highly relevant when you look at the digitalized environment going into the future, where we will be interacting with data far more than we'll be interacting with the actual movement of frame. Um, that is just a, a real thing. We will be living in this virtual universe where we have these digital twins that represent frame. Um, core element is also around the fact that uh, we really want to have a single source of truth. What I mean by that is we don't want entities to start copying each other's data and redistributing it because you no longer know what is what and who did what. So whoever is originating data, they become the, uh, the, the they, man, they manage and maintain that, that relationship with the data. They're the owners, they're sovereign, so they decide what happens, they manage the quality of the data, and they can also manage who gets access to it, which of course then allows us to uh, guarantee trust. And the last one uh, was actually the first one that we focused on was that this is about data, it's not about documents. And so, so everything we've done is data-centric design. It took us a while to divorce from the concept of documents because it's so embedded in our industry that, for example, you have a airway bill or in your case a bill of lading. It's such a fundamental concept that it's so hard to drop it and to say, I can move things without the concept of an airway bill. What I need is the data that's in the airway bill. I don't actually care about the document. And even today, when I explain this to airline people, they most of the time they, they look at me like I'm crazy um, and, and this is not going to work. But believe me, it's about data, it's not about documents. Um, the, the model we have developed, the data model, uh, is also one that takes a different approach to what we had before. Again, we're not talking about documents anymore. We're talking about special areas, uh, special use cases, perhaps. So we, at the center of it all, we have something that really uh, represents the, uh, the basics of airline, airline business. But around it is all the things like um, dangerous goods, pharma, uh, customs, ground handling, containers, you name it. And so we have all of these different areas that we develop and plug in, and we develop them with special user groups that are experts in these particular areas. So even from a design perspective, we can we can carve out a group of experts, get them to do their stuff, tell us how they want to model it, and then plug it into the central model. And now we have a whole new area that we can work with. Um, just a few comments, uh, and then I'll finish because I have a little bit of time also for, for questions. Um, I mentioned before we have the concept of digital logistics. Actually, what it is, is just the fact that we have an API with security. Uh, our API is, um, it's a little bit different from what are many APIs. And many APIs that are being developed today, uh, they're very, they're specific. For example, a, a company, a carrier may have a booking API. You go to the booking API and you request a quote and you make a booking. If you want to get an update on your shipment, perhaps you go to a status API, or endpoint we call it, or you might go to a scheduled API, or whatever API you want to use, a lot of companies have it all different APIs. What we have done here is slightly different. We have one API for everything. And again, I compare it to the USB port on your laptop. You only have one port, and it 
it as a you don't have uh, two ports, one for uh, a mouse and the other for your headphones, and another one for a power, and for a charging, and the other for the screen, right? It used to be like that, but not anymore. Today you have one port that you can have. So, same with the one record approach, you can have logistics, one API. Does now, if you're in APIs, you might wonder, well, how is that even possible? And the reason it's possible is that the intelligence and the data that we're sharing is built into our data model. It is not built into the API. It's not even built into the signature of the API. So that is that is something that is slightly different. Uh, it gives us more flexibility in the future because we don't have to extend the API. We can use one API at a time. And if we have a new era, for example, recently looking into space logistics about getting freight from the ground to the space station, for example, um, in fact, she did a PhD in it. So this is a real thing. Um, if we wanted to add space logistics to a one record environment, we could easily do it. We just build a data model for what works in space, how does this work with respect to perhaps the logistics at the spaceport, um, all of that stuff. And we just pl we plug it into our data model and use the same API to access it. And remember what I said before everything is represented by a URL or a URI, it's the technical term, but by a URL. And so, again, you have a URL that actually leads you to a specific booking, to a status, to a person, to a company, and all of that is pushed through that standard API. The API itself is recently advanced or sophisticated enough. Uh, we're using JSON, in fact, a special version of JSON, JSON LD, which has to do with the idea of using uh, URLs rather than that. We're using PubSub, which means that you can subscribe to certain information and when you need an update, it will actually be sent to you. So you don't have to keep checking whether it's there and you'll actually get the update. It's a bit like subscribing to a magazine. It will send to you when it's ready. Uh, we're using protocols for making sure that any data changes are audited, auditable, and they're also recorded so that we can always see how things were at some point during the uh, interactions. Um, we have a very well-defined access control. And uh, what I mean by that is that the party that provides the information, the data to other parties, really decides whether or not they want to give you access to it. So the, if you look at the information that was currently in the manual bill, we might decide that the things like the shipper address and the consignee address are for everybody along the transport chain. So anybody that wants that, they can get it. But anybody that wants to get perhaps details about the commercial value of the goods, that might be limited to the customs and perhaps to the shipper and the consignee, but no one else, right? So we, we have to find a mechanism that allows us to control that. So we can really have a very fine control of, of who sees what. And then we have a last concept I won't explain too much detail, but it's delegation, which means that if I host data and I provide it to the next party, if that next party wants to provide that information to a third party, they have to find a mechanism for me to find out that they want access to that, to approve it or to not approve it. So we can delegate the information to a third party and manage that in the control. We also have a security layer. We're using standard technologies. Uh, it says neutral TLS, which for most people means HTTPS and procedural browsing is on the rest. We use that plus some protocols that are not dissimilar to the way that for example, Facebook or Google manage your access to third party information. Won't go into the detail, um, it's all out there, you can, you can find it. And in fact, that brings me to uh, the third last slide, I think it is. Um, we've done a lot of work in trying to communicate this. There's some technologies are new to some people, so we've done a lot of work in communicating, building webinars, building documents that describe it, and we've developed a developer portal so that. Anybody that actually wants to use this, they can go there and they literally find answers to everything they want, including program environments, uh, examples, how this works. We even have a sandbox that people can go to and try to learn with. And so it's all out there. We, we, we try to make it as simple as possible because we, we learned that if one thing developing a standard, if you can't communicate it in a meaningful way, then you have nothing, right? So that's a very important thing. We're also running a number of pilot projects. Um, Essentially, if you look on the right, I don't know if you can see that the gradient is small, but it may not be the small, I don't know. 
But so we, the way we work is we look for a, for a use case, for example, of cargo distribution, which in our world means how we, uh, how we sell our capacity and the rates that go with it, and how we actually get to the end customer with that information. Uh, it's things like pharma, it's things like, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, airport hubs where things are happening, integration with trucking, for example. So we have these use cases. We work with the number of partners that we use to find that out. And little by little, not only does the standard grow, but also the usage of the standard. And so at the moment, um, we have something like 50 or so companies that are involved in this. There are some big names in there. Uh, at least in our world, they have big names. You may not know them in your world, uh, but I'm sure you've heard of airports like Heathrow. I'm sure you've heard of Kiosk, um, uh, Virgin Atlantic, you know. So there are these, these are, these are well-known names. Uh, some you would not know, Pactol, for example, is, is the airport handler in uh, Shanghai. And, and so you have all of these, these, these very important players that participate in this. And we sort of, we created seven pilots where they are, Grouping together to study certain opportunities and challenges. So it's a very pragmatic way of not only developing the standard, but also getting it out there. And that brings me back to one of my earlier points about IATA. Um, yes, it's great to have a single organization coordinated all. It gives us a lot of capabilities in accessing companies that want to work with us, but we still have to sell it one by one. It's still equity, still have to buy it. So in that sense, um, it's, it's not a done deal. We still have to do something. Um, my last slide, perhaps, um, uh, this comes back to the, the, the sort of the multimodal and the intermodal story. Um, we're working with the EU in a number of countries. You can see that on the consortium on the left, um, where we are trying to put together all of the existing work that has been done in digitalization on platforms that exist and how we can integrate these platforms to create a coherent and an accessible environment within the EU, uh, but of course the concept could, could, could go elsewhere, but certainly within the EU, um, so, so that if somebody does need to plan a shipment that may well start, um, even in, in the UK, so may well start in China, and somehow make its way via uh, ports, uh, road first, and then ports, maritime, it might do a little bit by air, and might do some, 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 some movement by rivers as well, or trains. So we're trying to, how, how to do that, how to integrate these different platforms in a way that makes it possible and that makes it feasible and, and, and easy, in quotes. And so this is an extremely important environment. Not only do we look at the, at the governance challenges, technical challenges, but it's also a platform for people like us to meet other people like you. Uh, and, and that perhaps is the biggest value of it. And with that, um, I, um, I, I finish my presentation and I invite uh, Kathy to come back and I will stop sharing. This. Great. Thank you very much, Hank. Um, you do have quite a lot of questions. This has generated a lot of discussion. Unfortunately, in the interests of time, I'm going to have to limit it because our, our next um, virtual lineup of speakers are, are standing in this moderation queue. But there is there is a particular question that a few people have asked. And um, Michael Lind asks, what hinders the whole supply chain world to establish one record service across the modes of transport? I think I need to go back to the, the slide when I say that 95% of our transport is done using 1980s standards, EDI. And, and that, that transformation, the actual digital transformation, or rather technology transformation, is a big investment and a big hurdle for many companies. But the bigger part, and I think this is the answer to my question from my perspective, is the mindset. Is that we have an entire generation of professionals who are experts at logistics and transport. They really are, it doesn't get better. But the mindset is still, well, I fill in a form, either paper or digital, and I send it to the next person. And so convince these people that they need to share this information digitally using the same tools they use at home for booking tickets and for buying stuff at Amazon, and they use the same technology at work. This mindset change, I think, is the big hurdle. The technology is there, the standards are there, 
we know exactly how to do it. But getting this mindset change is really simple. And from my side, I think actually, interestingly, we have we have quite a few people involved in this event today from the likes of um, GS1 and um, DCSA and so on. Um, are you talking to um, maritime counterparts about this? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Uh, I'm doing it right now. Um, but uh, good answer. We, we have a good relationship. With the have a good relationship with the DCSA. For um, when DCSA was, was being created, at the very beginning, um, I was going to say they were smart enough to come to us, but it's, that doesn't sound right. Um, they actually came to IATA to say, well, how do you do that? How do you run uh, an industry association that uh, sets standards for the industry? And, and, and we've had an ongoing conversation with them. And, and to be honest, uh, there's not much we have to teach them. They're really smart people. They know exactly what their problems are. We have managed to share what are some of the things that we have run into that, that can cause problems. Things that if you do them wrong, you lose 20 years. You know, So, so you need to bring in uh, regulators. You need to work with these industry associations. You need to be very careful how you work with um, solution providers as an association. So, so some of those little lessons that, that we've learned the hard way we share and, and, and for me it's great to talk to them because they have a blank sheet that they're starting from uh, and, and so i can learn from them also about you know, how they can skip certain steps so yes absolutely we are in close contact with them well i'm and that's just one of them there are I'm, as, as you know i'm 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 sorry that uh the session one of the sessions we had planned was um a live um dialogue between yourself and andre simmer from the DCSA, who I think the, the two of you would have been exchanging some quite interesting um, ideas and challenges and learnings. But but we'll save that for the next in-person event that we can actually get out there. Um, Hank, thank you so much. I have to uh, call it time now for our next session to get going. But I'm really glad you could join us today. I hope you'll stick around and, and chat to a few more people. I think there, there were quite a few more questions and, and insights and comments on your presentation today so um i'm sure there'll be a few people reaching out to you um, but thanks very much nice to see you and look forward to um learning more and working more closely with our as well thanks a lot hank bye-bye